I preach this morning in the name of God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are now six weeks into the story, the story of God who made us and loves us and wants us back, and we have come this morning to a chapter that I have been eager to preach on from the very beginning. For in the wandering in the wilderness, we see a picture of our Christian life on this world. Just as earlier in the story, Joseph was a picture of Jesus and Pharaoh was a picture of Satan, so the wandering in the wilderness, these 40 years from the time from when God brought his people up out of Egypt to when God brought them into the promised land, this wandering in the wilderness is a picture of our life on this earth with God. For just like the Israelites, we too have already been redeemed. We have already been redeemed, but we are not yet brought home And far too often, like the Israelites, we get sidetracked, we get lost, we turn back on the way. And so as we read through this chapter, we are really looking into a mirror. So let's take a look in the mirror and see what this chapter shows us about ourselves. And the first thing it shows us is that we do an awful lot of grumbling. If you would, please open up to the maps on the inside front cover of the book. Open up to the map on the inside front cover of the book. Now the Israelites... Remember that they were slaves in Egypt, which means that every last one of them was born and raised and had lived all of their lives in Egypt, in and around the city of Noph in Egypt. Now God was bringing them to the Holy Land, in and around the city of Jerusalem, but for the last year, they had been stuck halfway down at Mount Sinai on the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula. And now, after a year camped out at Mount Sinai on the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula, now after a year, at last, they are on their way. And God himself is leading them. God himself is leading them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to this promised land that they have all heard about, but not a one of them has ever seen. And finally, they are going there. There is excitement, there is anticipation, and yet no sooner do they set out on their journey than they begin to grumble. Let's take a look. Page 72, page 72, up at the top. Page 72 at the top. So the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again the Israelites started wailing and said, Ah, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Now, first of all, ask yourself, how bad do things have to be so that you actually look forward to eating leeks, onions, and garlic? It's pretty bad. And the Israelites thought that's how bad it was. Now, on the one hand, I kind of get it. I mean, because truly, for the last year, they really did have nothing to eat but this manna for a whole year. And that's like eating a bologna sandwich for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day, day after day after day after day after day. Now, I like bologna sandwiches as much as the next guy, you know. But I don't like them that much. So on the one hand, I get it. The Israelites thought they had it pretty bad. But on the other hand, how bad really was it for the Israelites? Or to put it another way, was life back in Egypt really all that good? Because take a close look at what they actually say at the top of page 72. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. You know why it was at no cost? Because they had no money. They were slaves. They were slaves. And yet how quick they were to forget what slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh was really like. And how quick we are to look back nostalgically on the sins of our past life and overlook the God, the good that God is doing for us here and now every single day. How quick we are to forget. So quick. That sometimes God helps us to remember by handing us over to our sins, by handing us over to do the very thing that we want. Bottom of page 72. And now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat of it. And you will not eat of it just for one day, or two days, or five, or ten, or twenty, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and you have wailed before him, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? 
God says, you want to eat meat? Fine, I'll give you meat. You know, when I was a boy, probably 10 or 12 years old, my mom caught my older sister smoking a cigarette. And so my mom went to the store and she bought a pack of cigarettes and then she sat me and my sister down. She said, you want to smoke? Let's smoke. And she made my sister and I smoke cigarette after cigarette after cigarette until we got sick like old Pinocchio here, right? And man, did I learn my lesson. Huh? And I think that's what God is doing too. God is teaching the Israelites a lesson. He says, you want to know what it's like to live in your past life? Go ahead. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. God is teaching them a lesson to distinguish between their needs and their wants. And God is teaching them a lesson that he always provides. He always provides. God provided manna for the Israelites every single day. God gives us our daily bread every single day. So we ought to be thankful for what we have. We ought to be thankful for what God has given us. We ought to be thankful for what God has done for us. We ought to be thankful for the new normal, which is our redeemed life with him. Because I guarantee you that the good old days in Egypt were not nearly so good as you remember them. So quit your grumbling and be grateful for what God has done for you. Be grateful for what you have. Amen? Amen. So that's the first lesson we learned from this wandering in the wilderness, is that we've got to quit grumbling and be grateful because God always, he always provides. And the second lesson has to do with the promised land. Now leave your finger here because we're going to come back to this spot and then go back to the, uh, the maps on the inside front cover. So, the Israelites set out from Mount Sinai in the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula, and pretty soon, after a couple of weeks, they come up to Kadesh Barnea, which is on the southern border of the Promised Land. At last, they have arrived. After a full year of living in the desert, 400 years after Jacob and his sons left the Promised Land, at last, some of their descendants are now back at the border. They have arrived. This is it. And so God tells Moses to send scouts into this promised land that they have all heard about, but not a one of them has ever seen. The scouts go, they come back with a good report, and they report that the promised land is everything God promised them it was, and even more. Let's take a look. It's on page 75, page 75 in the middle. So at the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land, and then later in that paragraph... They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and boy, it does flow with milk and honey. Behold, here is some of its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and really large. And the more the spies begin talking about those people, the more the spies begin talking about those cities, the more powerful the people become, the more fortified and large the cities become. And they're telling of it, bottom of page 75, all the people, all the people were of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. Those are the giants. We seemed like little grasshoppers in our own eyes, and so we seemed also to them in the top of the next page. And that night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept out loud, and all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, Ah, oh, if only we had died in Egypt or even in this wilderness. Why? Why is the Lord bringing us up to this land to let us die by the sword? Our wives and our kids will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said, we should choose a leader and go back. It's a tragedy and it's a farce. Right there at the very border of the promised land and they choose to go back. It's a tragedy and it's a farce. But you know, don't we do the very same thing? Turn back from God's promises. Focus not on God's promise to go with us, but only on the problem that is before us. And that problem becomes bigger and bigger and bigger in our telling of it until finally we convince ourselves that there's no way, no, no possible way we can ever get around it. We seem like a little bug in their eyes, just like this poor guy right here, right? Not a great picture. You see, when we lose sight of God's upper story promise and focus only on our lower story problems, 
When we lose sight of God's promise to go with us and focus only on the problem before us, well, that problem naturally grows bigger and bigger and bigger in our mind's eye until at last we convince ourselves that there is no way we can possibly overcome it. And so we give up and we turn back before we even get started. And that is a failure. It's a failure of faith. A failure to trust that God is able to do what God is asking you to do. And without faith, there is no hope. Without faith, there is no victory. Without faith, there is only defeat. My friends, do you have faith in the Lord God today? Because he has promised you. He has promised to bring you to himself and to bring you to his home in heaven. He has promised to give you abundant life now in eternal life in the age to come. And though sin, death, and the devil may stand before you, may stand in your way like a 350-pound sumo wrestler, yet God has promised it. And he is able to do what he is asking you to do. He will give you the victory. He will give you life. He will bring you to himself because he has promised to do it, but you have to hold on to that promise by faith. And if you don't, if you let it go, if you lose faith, if you lose heart, if you lose courage, if you turn back, well, God will let you go just as he let them Bottom of page 77. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you this very thing I have heard you say. In this wilderness your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census, who has grumbled against me, not one of you, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except for Caleb and Joshua. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. And once again, God punishes his people by giving them the very thing that they want. Only notice this time that when God does it, he is faithful to his promises. God will bring their children into the promised land just as he promised Abraham some 400 years earlier that his descendants would return and inherit this promised land. That is exactly what God will do. God will bring their children into the land as promised and God will even provide for them. That faithless, fearful generation that turned back, God will provide for them, feeding them with manna every single day for the next 40 years. God is always faithful to his promises, even when they are not. God's grace never goes off course, even when their faith goes astray, and their faith went astray. They, they missed out. That generation that God redeemed from under the grip of Pharaoh, that God brought through the waters of the Red Sea, that God brought to Mount Sinai, that God brought up to the very border of the promised land, and they turned back and they said, no thanks. And God wasn't about to make them go in. God wasn't about to drag them into the promised land if they didn't want it. And God is not about to drag you either. God has made promises to you. God has redeemed you from the grip of Pharaoh. God has marked you with the blood of the Lamb. God has brought you through the waters of baptism. God has made you his very own people. God is providing for you each and every day. God is leading you now. And at the end of your life, God will lead you home with him into heaven. But if you don't really want to go there, he won't make you. And if you really want to turn back, he will let you go. That would be a tragedy, and that would be a failure, not of God's grace, but of your faith. Don't make that mistake. Don't miss out on the promised land like they did. God is always faithful to his promises, even when we are not. And that's the second lesson that we learn from our wilderness wandering today. And the third, well, the third lesson is a hard one. 
Because, you know, frankly, sometimes God just seems mean. God just seems mean, especially in these chapters here. I mean, just consider Moses. And why should Moses miss out? Why should Moses miss out on the promised land? I mean, the Israelites, I get, right? They were annoying and they were unruly. They were grumbling and they were ungrateful. They lacked in faith and they made their choice to turn back. I understand why the Israelites should miss out, but why Moses? I mean, Moses not only had to put up with those people, Moses had to lead those people 40 years through a desert eating bologna sandwiches for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day. And remember how many of those people there were? The Bible tells us 600,000 men. That does not include women and children. We're talking about 2 million people at all. And Moses led them 275 miles from Egypt to the promised land through a desert on foot. That's like moving the population of San Antonio to Dallas through the hill country on foot. And Moses did it. He got it done. Can you really blame the guy for losing his patience once? For losing his temper once? For lashing out in anger once? Well, apparently God can. Top of page 79. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? And Moses raised his staff and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out the community and the livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community in the land that I will give to them. And it feels like God is being unfair to Moses. It feels like God is overreacting feels like God is being mean. But remember, God is holy. God is holy. And God demands holiness from those who represent him. God demands holiness from those who lead in his name and by his authority. Jesus himself said, those to whom much is given from them shall much be expected. And it only takes one. It only takes one single misdeed to undermine and ruin a whole lifetime of achievement. And man, haven't we seen that tale told far too many times in the media these past few years? Or consider this hypothetical. How many times would you have to catch me, let's say, drunk driving, or pocketing some of the offering? or watching internet porn on the church computer, how many times would you have to catch me doing that before you fired me? One time. Once. Because as a leader of this church, as the pastor of this church, you and God hold me to a high standard. Moses was the leader of God's people. Moses was the mediator of God's covenant. Moses was called a friend of God. So Moses was held to the highest standard of them all. Down here, God may seem mean, but God is holy, and he demands holiness from those who serve him, from those who represent him. Down here, God may seem mean, but God is merciful. And the upper story, with a long horizon in view, God is merciful, for even in the death of Moses... God gives us a picture of his son, Jesus Christ. And God gives that picture to us first in the negative, that Moses is the mediator of the old covenant, who can bring his people to the border of the promised land, but cannot bring them in. Only Jesus, the holy, perfect, sinless mediator of a new covenant, can do that. So in the death of Moses, God gives us a picture of his son, first in the negative, but then also in the positive, That Moses' death on the top of Mount Nebo is like Jesus' death on the cross. The promise, the leader who can bring his people to the promised land, but only at the cost of his own life. God is merciful. And even in the death of Moses, we see a picture of Jesus, his son. And remember that the next time we do see Moses, he is in the promised land. 
He's on the top of the mountain of transfiguration, talking with Jesus, radiant in the glory of God. God is holy. God is merciful. He's not mean. Sometimes he just seems that way. Which is why we need to remember who God is, what God has done, and what God has promised to do. Because forgetfulness is the great enemy of faith. That generation that God redeemed as slaves in Egypt, that God brought up out of Egypt, that God brought through the waters of the Red Sea, that God himself came down to live with them on Mount Sinai, that God provided manna for them every day for 40 years, that God led to the very border of the promised land, and yet how quick they were, how quick they were to forget all that God had done for them and who God was. And how quick we are to forget all that God does for us and who God is. Because he has redeemed us. He is providing for us. And he will lead us home. Forgetfulness is the great enemy of faith. And so as we wander through this wilderness, as we take this journey through our life with God, let us not forget But let us always remember that God is holy, that God always provides, and that God is always faithful to his promises, even when we are not, so that we don't get distracted or turn back on the way. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, We thank you and we praise you for this day that you have given to us. Lord, you have redeemed us. You sent your son Jesus to die for us on the cross once for all, and you have marked us with his blood. You have redeemed us. Lord Jesus, you are leading us home. God, give us grace to not grumble, but rather to be grateful, to not turn back in fear, but rather to press ahead in faith. God, give us grace to walk through this life as your people. For we ask it, Jesus, in your name. Amen.